Coming up on Digital Music Trends 197, recorded on the 19th of August 2014, Bandpage teams up with Spotify, the latest financials from SFX, Pono's successful crowdfunder campaign, Mixcloud launches pro and premium accounts, and the latest on Vivo. This week's show is brought to you by Play MPE, providing secure music distribution and promotional services to the world's largest labels for over 10 years. Play MPE can be accessed on Windows and Mac computers, iOS, Android and BlackBerry mobile devices. Find out more on plaympe.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and if you're watching or listening to the show on a streaming service, remember that should you wish to carry it with you on the go, you can download download it both as an audio and a video podcast using Apple's podcast app, Downcast for iOS, which I recommend, or Dogcatcher on Android as well. So, um, And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out, you can check out bit.ly slash DMT list and you'll get a weekly email telling you the shows that we've been producing and putting out and this week it's a real pleasure to have two great guests and i'm joined by sammy andrews head of digital at the independent label cooking vinyl so hi sammy and thanks for joining me today how's it going I'm very well, thank you. And you're in London as well, so we're both we're both here. And uh, joining me from the States is uh, Steve Rani, uh, the uh, manager of Incubus and uh, the founder of uh, uh, Ranman uh, Music and Business. So hi, Steve, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Thank you. It's great Happy to, to be here. It's great to have you once again, and uh, uh, always a pleasure to have you back. And uh, we'll have plenty of time to chat more about cooking vinyl and uh, around my music and business during the show. But I would like to kick off by talking about the partnership between Spotify and Bandpage. So, uh, what happened? So, uh, Bandpage has been on a roll in the past few months. Uh, they've really uh, completed a pretty difficult pivot for the company over the last year, but they've s- seemed to have nailed it. And the latest confirmation comes from the partnership the, uh, the company struck with the Spotify. So, in Interestingly, actually, this partnership doesn't uh, focus on the data side of things, which is uh, what uh, has been sort of the key uh, part of the Bandpage proposition until now, uh, whereby, you know, Bandpage would uh, offer a flow of information and uh, essentially keep uh, third party apps up to date with uh, band biographies and everything else, which are updated directly from the band. But this time it actually focuses on Bandpage's uh, store and Bandpage uh, has uh, created a a store for a storefront for artists where they can list uh, merchandise, both physical and and uh, sort of event related. It can be also virtual gigs or anything like that. And uh, uh, this partnership will enable uh, Bandpage artists uh, to essentially uh, have these uh, uh, merchandise items pop up in their uh, Spotify artist page, which is pretty I- interesting because it's uh, one of the first times that uh, you know a streaming service of, of this size is offering this kind of functionality. Of course, uh, Spotify tried to do it with a top spin, but uh, given all that's happened at top spin in the last few months, uh, that that hasn't really taken off. And it w- apparently it was quite a convoluted process to try and get your merch up there. So this uh, uh, could be the first time that this is available on a, on a wide scale. There's a few artists that have already signed up, like Porter Robinson, Miranda Lambert, uh, Ariana Grande, the, the sort of breakthrough artist of Universal for uh, this year, and uh, Tea Leaf Green and Stone Foxes, offering all sorts of different types of uh, merch on there. And it feels like a great deal for both companies. So, uh, uh, Steve, from, from your point of view as, as a manager and somebody that advises bands on a daily basis, uh, how do you feel about this partnership? And can can we start finally to see the unlocking of the, the hidden potential of streaming in terms of revenues? Uh, first off, for the interest of uh, accuracy, I am the former manager of Incubus. Uh, Sorry. You know, I've, yes. I've now retired, but uh, I still have a uh, whole enough. <laughs> host of experience on that regard. I think these whole things, first off, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Bandpage and their efforts to um, help artists get their word out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, standing out from the crowd has always been. Uh, I think the biggest issue in the music business, uh, that was true when the industry is putting out 5,000 records a year. It's, it's, it's even more true you know, now that there are God knows how many releases out there. Um, this whole idea of the VIP experience, I always look at these, you know, and I can't help but look at them through the eyes of a manager who worked with a successful band. And um, you know, I think <clears throat> people um, outside the day-to-day of the music business, I think have a tendency to put more weight to this as an income source than perhaps is is real. Right. And um, so I think um, these VIP experiences uh, get tricky with artists because the more successful they get, the more demands there are on their time. 
And, and while I think it's a great thing for artists, whether you're a big artist or a small artist, to develop a personal connection with, with your audience, um, you know, these VIP experiences take a lot of time. Yeah. And, and so they cut into the band's time to do all kinds of other things that are either more important or more profitable and so forth. So I think, you know, that needs to, to, to be said. Um, so in a sense, I, you're, you're pro, you know, you're, you're for all for the merchandise offering, but uh, you sort of uh, advise bands to be wary when they try to do more than that. No, I'm not advising them to be wary. I'm just basically stating a fact that there's only so many hours in a day. And had my experience with bands is if you're getting paid three or four hundred grand to go play a big show, uh, making an extra two, three, four grand on the side uh, doesn't have the same priority that other things might have. Right. Yeah. The, the whole idea of artists, you know, putting their merchandise um, and things to sell uh, in front of their customers when they're interested, I think is huge. So anything, yeah. whether it's Spotify, Rhapsody, uh, selling at Hot Topic, selling at your gigs, any place you can put your your products out for sale, the more the merrier. Right? Yeah. And I think that's true whether you're uh, in the band business or you know selling you know shirts um or, or clothes or whatever it might be yeah. um you know i saw one on here i read through the article and one of the other things that i'll that i'll mention when these conversations about vip experiences while they are ever so personal uh, i gotta tell you perhaps it's my old school mentality work here when i hear that a band is gonna have a a fan collaborate with them right uh on their art um, that, that, that feels strange. And I say that because if I paid $200 or $300, does that really earn me a right to be part of the creative process with a band? So I can't imagine what price I'd have to pay to go take my favorite band, let's say the Rolling Stones and go, you know, guys, I, I think we should do satisfaction this way, right? It just feels strange. And I think I can't help but think that most true artists, um, shouldn't make a habit out of collaborating with their fans they should make a habit out of collaborating on the music um with musicians yeah sammy any anything to add on that and uh, what are your thoughts on this uh, also uh, with a digital hat on uh, how how could you see this uh, coming coming together for artists um I'm, it's obviously i think it's been long overdue i think um and i've spoken about this a few times but the industry as a whole, and especially a lot of the the gateways to fan bases, we need to work together. And I fully encourage and like to see more of the you know live industry working with the stores, merch companies working with everyone, working with with each other. It will help generate a lot more income for the industry as a whole. Um, obviously, the, all all these different avenues have access to fan bases, and we should be sharing that data and we should be sharing that revenue between people. Yeah. Um, and I think the merch offerings make a lot of sense. I mean, I, I kind of agree with Steve. I think VIP experiences can be a little bit tricky. That you know, they're, they're received in different ways by different people, but they do benefit some artists. And you know, some of the smaller bands that can't afford to go out on the road do do sometimes need that extra income from VIP experiences. So I get both sides of the the coin with that. But um, I'm really glad to see it, and I hope we see more of it. Um, and I, I didn't look enough into the um, you know the rev shares and stuff, but as long as it's yet but um as long as it's good for all parties i think it's a brilliant yeah. thing and i really do want to see more of it from i mean other. I, I know that spotify doesn't take any a uh, cut out of it i'm not sure what the financial uh, arrangements with Bandpage are no i'm not sure i no, I, I couldn't see anything in that article but i'm you know presumably it's good and um oh, hopefully it's good yeah and hopefully we see more of it and, and on, the, on the top spin front have you have you got any news on what happened to the artists that were signed up to top spin because I, I don't really know what happened there i'm, I'm not sure how, no i'm not sure how that played out I mean, we had a few artists um uh from a few separate things that were uh did host most with them but they've none of, no one's come to us directly and said you know what's going on but um i yeah. hope we'll see a lot of people adopt this going forward yeah steve yeah, no, I, I, I think that's all good stuff. That whole idea of getting your stuff out wherever you, you can is just so important because um, you get precious few opportunities to make a connection and have people uh, be interested in what you're doing. And I mentioned I'm a big fan of a band page. I, I'm an even bigger fan of Spotify and this idea that you can you know type in just about anything and access a huge uh, library of uh, music 
Um, I just can't even tell you how big I think that is at the end of the day. Particularly, I think uh, you know, for folks like myself that are that have been doing this for a while, I'm almost I'm in my fifties, and uh, the fact that I can go and press and type in any band that I've ever listened to in my life and hear them. Um, is is huge i think some of the other things that are fun about spotify is the ability to see what your friends are are uh, listening to and so forth which really does some of the same things we did with our taste making friends back in high school and college but you can just do it on your own terms now. and i think that's the big the big sea change in the music business that i've yeah, witnessed the discovery in it. elements brilliant yeah the discovery and the ability to to to, to build a conversation around music um is terrific and and to be able to do it wherever you want is, is even better uh, so those are all the things that i think are great about it. you know where it all plays out in terms of i think merchandise will take the same share of income in these other outlets that it does at a concert and everything and lots of people talk about how much money bands make for merchandise yeah but my experience has been that you make the bulk of your money by showing up and playing a gig and the uh the merchandise in the big scheme of things, is is more gravy than steak in, in yeah. my experience. But a, a good a good bit of gravy though, lots yeah. of gravy <laughs> on your steak and potatoes. And it also really depends on the size of the band, of course. You know, if you're talking about smaller size bands, they might just break even with a gig uh, by touring yeah. the U.S. and they yeah. might make yeah. their money off merch. So it just yeah. really depends on the size. Yeah, and I think the thing that gets lost too is that when you're talking about smaller bands, they they they. There's really kind of two states of being in reality of the music business. You're either nowhere, struggling, trying to make ends meet, or you're somewhere, you're one direction, right? And and within that whole merchandising sphere, you'll find that bands like One Direction might do 25 bucks a head in merchandise, where a band like Incubus uh, might do five or six bucks a head. So there's some big, wide gaps and what those merch rates are. Yeah. Um, but my experience is, is if you were breaking down the, the, the income sources for most artists, particularly ones that have a live uh, element to it, um, the vast, vast majority of their income to their pocket comes from touring. Yeah, yeah. At the highest levels, not in the beginning days. In the beginning days, yeah, it's those mostly are tough, work. Those days. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, Sammy's smiling. She knows because she probably gets to write a few checks for those ones that don't quite get there. I, right, I started Sammy? life as, as a tour manager and promoter, so I know, I know exactly how tough uh, those initial days are. <laughs> yes, indeed. I, I, these first few lines in my forehead were from being a promoter. The last few were from being a manager. Yeah. And uh, no, it's, uh, you're talking about touring, actually, it's an interesting one, because that segues uh, well into our next story, which is about SFX. So uh, SFX Entertainment releases Q2 financial report, and on the revenue side, things are looking good. Uh, the revenues grew almost by 200%, uh, although a portion of those revenues came from acquisitions that were not fully under SFX's control during Q2. On the flip side, the company's losses almost doubled to 43.7 million. On the festival front, though, on the live front, it's really good news, as attendance to the events organized by SFX grew by 33%, and earnings rose by 39%. Uh, um, it should be taken into account that SFX's revenues are, uh, you know, mostly in Q3 and Q4. You know, their highest revenues are there. Most of their events are there. And so it's going to be interesting to see how uh, their 50 plus events that are going to be in the second half of the year uh, are going to pan out. That's going to be uh, paramount to their earnings and also how the uh, sort of uh, acquisitions end up uh, uh, melding into the company and sort of how those are going to affect earnings going forward. Uh, on the live front, of course, SFX is a, a EDM, uh, the, that dreaded term for us Brits, uh, an EDM focused company. And, uh, uh, you know, it's it's an interesting gamble because nobody really knows how long this EDM uh, uh, wave will last uh, and, and how scalable it is. And, you know, this is the one company that has become a listed company uh, working almost exclusively on, on EDM uh, uh, offerings. Uh, uh, Steve, on, on your end, you know, how do you feel about about SFX in general and all the acquisitions they've made in the last few months. Have you got a viewpoint on that? Oh, yeah. Uh, SFX is really Bob Sillerman, and this is not his first um, attempt to roll up uh, individual properties, in, take them public, um, ultimately sell his share and move on to the next one. He did it first for you folks that aren't as old as I am. He did it first in the radio business consolidated a bunch of small radio stations, put it into a bigger company, sold it to a bigger company. He, he took the money he made there and rolled up what were little individual fiefdoms of big promoters across America and now to some extent over in the UK. Um, 
and took that company public and then ultimately moved on to some other things, right? So he's got a nose for action, Bob Silverman does, you know? Uh, is he an EDM fan? I don't know. I saw the cover of Billboard magazine. I suppose I could put on a black leather jacket and, you know, pump up something in the background. But, you know, I'm not sure he's a, an EDM fan. What's interesting from my perspective is, is that Live Nation, which is the biggest, baddest public company, has had some, you know, interesting growing pains, you know, being in the concert business across the whole of every genre, including EDM right now, right? Yeah. So for... For a company, a public company to exist within one genre alone, I think will be a challenge based on all the challenges I've seen with, um, with um, Live Nation. Um, what's also interesting is that Live Nation, love them or hate them, has a whole group of very experienced people in the, in the business of putting on concerts. And I've now been to a few EDM concerts with my, my sons, and they are spectacular productions of sound and lights. But mm -hmm. knowing more than a few players in the concert business, come to find that some of the biggest, most famous EDM concerts don't make any money for the promoters because the promoters spend so much money on the production and the vibe at these concerts, right? So it becomes that classic trade-off that, that managers talk about with artists about your creative vision versus your expectation or as a public company, your need to deliver profits, right? Yeah. And uh, so if the biggest EDM festivals aren't making the kind of money that Lollapalooza is making, you know, if you're in the business of concerts, Sammy will agree, that's a problem, yeah. okay? Now put a public, you know, company backdrop on that, and it'll be very interesting to see how this goes. Their revenues have gone up because they bought a lot of company. Their, the attendance at these festivals is up, and I believe that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the festival business in general is dependent on a steady supply of headliners. And once you've gone through headliners five or six times, you've seen Avicii, you've seen Skrillex, you've seen um, Diplo, whoever it might be, um, those things will decline unless you keep this steady supply of headliners happening. So that's, that's the way it's played out in the big concert business. Hard for me to believe that in the end of the day it will be any different in the EDM space. Yeah. I, I do. I, I think it potentially could be different in EDM because I think rather than just it being a, um, your average concert or festival, there is a lot to do with the experience there. Like I said, there are mass outgoings for a lot of these things with, with the large productions. But a lot of people are going to this for experience, and I think we see that to some degree translate to the sales that come with that. The sales aren't huge at the moment that accompany with EDM. It's a very, there is a thriving live space, but we haven't necessarily seen the, the conversion through to sales. And that's not to say that we won't, I don't think, and, you know, but, uh, Beatport still looks promising to me for, to some degree. But um, I think it is a different space, and I think the live sector potentially could thrive with EDM, because it is experience based. And I think a lot of people go not necessarily to see a, a main headline act, they're going to, you know, have a really good time and, and enjoy that experience. Yeah. Well, something else that to throw in there is that having, I started in the concert business, you know, when I first started in the music business, and I think Sammy would agree. The competition amongst promoters is just ridiculous, right? So where lots yeah. of these young EDM promoters operated under the radar of the big promoters who didn't understand it and were very dismissive of it, now Live Nation gets it. They understand 80,000 bodies in, a, yeah. in, in some kind of venue. And quite that high trend, ticket pricing as well. Well, see, that, what I'm saying is so some of these things ain't play out. But here's the rub. Those... Very same promoters, SFX and Live Nation and AEG to some degree, are now going to bid up the talent. So if you're a manager of one of those big headliner acts, and I sometimes wish, yeah, maybe I missed my calling. I should have been managing EDM acts where at this point it's all about getting the money. I'll say, you guys figure out the lights. I'm going to go get us the money. and Here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to call up Bob and his crew and go, you know, I got this from the Live Nation guys. And if you want the show, you're going to have to pay. And that has been operating in the real music business for a while. So EDM is, is going to benefit from the comp The EDM artists are going to benefit uh, by the competition. But ultimately, the consumers will pay because promoters balance their lack of conscience on the ticket price, <laughs> plain and simple. And I believe that transcends genre as well. Fair yeah. comment, Sammy? <laughs> 
perhaps yes maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so a, the one it's, it's a totally different. Go manage some big, big EDM bands. Don't let the promoters sweat that your guarantee out. <laughs> That's a funny one. Actually, uh, it makes a lot funny of sense. Funny but true. <laughs> yeah, actually, it makes a lot of sense uh, while we are uh, talking about EDM uh, to bring in uh, my next uh, guest for. Uh, the show, which is uh, Nico Perez, uh, the co-founder of Mixcloud. And go, hi Nico, yeah. how's it going? Hello, how's it going? All good, thanks. You? Good, good. Great so to see you. Nico you. calling in from? Uh, you're Live. in San Francisco, right? Yes, exactly. I'm Perfect. over here in uh, Sunset, San Francisco. Yes, you, know you are the you are the U.S. Uh, face of uh, Mixcloud at the moment. That's correct. Yes, I am. <laughs> awesome. So uh, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, you guys have got some uh, cool news uh, that are actually coming out tomorrow, which is actually today uh, for listeners, because this is not going to come out till Wednesday. So <laughs> do share, do share. What's, what's happening? Yeah, so we're um, excited to be announcing our new Pro and Premium accounts. Uh, and these are accounts, the Pro one is geared towards uploaders. The Premium one is more for listeners. Uh, and what you get with these accounts is... Um, in the listener premium case, you get an ad-free listening experience, and you also get to support the artists um, who are track listed within the mixes and radio shows on the site. Yeah. And with the um, pro uploader account, so that's for DJs, radio presenters, podcasters, people like that, um, you get an ac access to an analytics dashboard where you can see you know, where people are coming from, what they're listening to, how long they're listening for. Um, what device they're on, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and you also get access to features like being able to schedule your upload so that uh, it releases at a certain point in time or a certain date uh, and things like that. Awesome. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, the, it's a sort of double whammy uh, addressing both the listeners and the, and the uploaders on, on that front. And uh, we're talking about EDM and the SFX, uh, sort of the, the phenomenon there. So how, how are you positioning Mixcloud at the moment in the US? Is it, is it uh, very much a sort of uh, uh, EDM oriented? I know that in the UK we don't really like this term. But, uh, and, and how have you found the community over there? Because, of course, uh, you didn't have any, food, uh, any boots on the ground up until a few months ago. Yes, yeah, so EDM um, is obviously exploding here in, in America, and um, you know it's. We've always taken the approach of Mixcloud being a content agnostic platform in the sense that you know we don't want to be um, just an EDM platform or just a hip hop platform or just a you know a, a funk or jazz platform. We're, we're very much an open site. Um, what I can say though is that a lot of the electronic music is incredibly popular. And it does seem to be a really big uptake with the crowd that we have. Um, so that's helped uh, when I, I've moved over to New York now. And in, in the last six months, it's helped open up a lot of doors. Awesome. Uh, Steve, have you, have you heard about Mixcloud uh, yet? Uh, um, I'm not sure um, how, how far it's uh, it reached you. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm looking at your website right now, so I'm not going to bullshit and say, oh, yeah, so, but I'm of looking course, at yeah. it and listening. <laughs> That's great. And actually, actually, it's interesting because uh, uh, also with the acquisition of songs uh, by Spotify, by uh, uh, Google, in a sense, it kind of feels like there is a little bit of a gap. I mean, I mean, maybe a few months ago, I would have said that the space in the U.S. was quite saturated, but uh, it feels like there is still a gap there to to fall into. Where when you're looking at long term, long form content, uh, there isn't actually a whole lot of that. There is as curated as you guys. So that's yeah. I think we really feel that curation is the key, and I think if you look at you know why Apple acquired Beats, why Google acquired Songs. Uh, you know, that curation element is, is becoming important and people are realizing that. They're realizing that, you know, if you have a catalog of 15, 20, 30 million songs, you know, it, where do you start? Um, where do you start listening to things? Yeah, and so, yeah it's becoming you know, a whole little cottage industry in itself at the moment, you know, companies exactly. starting for curation and we're only going to see more of it, I think. Yeah. And so obviously you can approach it um, algorithmically and that's what Pandora have done and um, Last.fm have done in the past. Um, but we believe that actually humans are better at that. They're better at um, finding new artists. They're better at, um, you know, those signals take a long time to enter traditional algorithmic sy systems. Yeah. Uh, and so we believe that humans are better at uh, discovering new music. Interesting. And of course, for the benefit of our US listeners that may not be too familiar with the service, you guys are, have a compulsory license and it's uh, uh, by Sound Exchange, right? That's correct. So in the US, we are licensed by Sound Exchange. Uh, ASCAP, BMI, and SESAC. 
Perfect. And that's, uh, uh, of course, uh, something I, I like to stress, the fact that you're a licensed service and, uh, uh, of course, uh, bringing money back to the artists uh, uh, at the moment. And, well, that's fantastic. And uh, once again, uh, the Pro and Premium accounts are out for Mixcloud. So, Nico, thanks so much for your time. And, uh, uh, you know, go to Mixcloud.com. If you haven't heard of the service, check them out. And I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, DMT is actually on it as well. So uh, you'll find some good uh, audio content, too. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, it's interesting that we're talking to Mixcloud because they're a company that has self-funded from the beginning. They've never taken any uh, venture capital money, which is uh, quite a rare thing these days in, in the music industry. And uh, uh, um, another company that hasn't taken any institutional money but is taking uh, crowdfunded money is Pono. So uh, an interesting story here, uh, as Neil Young has launched a, a new crowdfunding campaign for Pono, uh, raising money uh, as essentially um, um, for investors to get equity in the company. The minimum investment is uh, five grand and uh, the valuation for the company is 50 million and incredibly the company has already raised 5.6 million in 19 days with an, another 11 days to go so it, they look set to beat the the record that, you know the 6.2 million raised on Kickstarter earlier this year for the actual hardware it's, it's very interesting that the, the take up on this I mean I've sort yeah. of been watching it a little bit because I'm still and I hope that there is a lot of work goes back into audio quality because I, I do feel like we've lost a lot of quality o over the years and I think a whole generation of people are growing up not really knowing what quality audio is which is sad but I'm also waiting to see whether that generation care about it to be <laughs> honest I'm, I'm, I'm interested in who's investing in this but obviously enough people care enough people think more people are going to care that the investment's been kind of insane on this one I think yeah it's absolutely insane it's uh, funny to hear you say that, Sammy, because I have two young sons, 18 and 20 years old, who probably listen to 90% of their music uh, on YouTube, on a computer. Yeah. Uh, like like uh, most people, I, th I think, a whole generation of people. Yeah. That so if that's our market going forward, um, I'm not sure this whole discussion of whether the sound is warmer on digital and all of these things. Um, I've been in the music business 36 years and hung out with lots of talented musicians and producers. And maybe I spent too many years in the concert business. But honestly, I can't tell the difference of what's warm or not. But I can tell a great song when I hear one. And yeah. a great song sounds good coming out of YouTube or your headphones. Um, what's interesting about this whole Neil Young thing is here's your kind of 60s hippie raising money out there from the fans which in days gone by we, I, I can only imagine he would have recoiled in horror at the thought <laughs> of it right uh, and now yeah. out there raising money but I do know one thing I had a chance to to work in a company called Artist Direct back in the early days of the internet we raised 110 million dollars and I'll say to all those people that are contemplating uh, investing in Neil Young's thing that you're no closer to home than an artist is when they sign a record deal and think that the game is over when it's really just starting. Yeah. And it might be easier to go spend $5,000 on that premium experience with Neil Young. Maybe he'll write a song with you. <laughs> I mean, it's it's. So a, pardon my cynicism. It's an interesting. But I was a big no, it does. Young it does. Fan. It remains. It remains to be seen. And so I think a lot of us are watching this, to, you know, to see if it, how much of it is hype. And I, I, I don't believe it is to some degree. I think there is some worth in, in high quality. And obviously, Neil Young doing it is a, a, a added selling point. But I'm yeah. waiting to see how this pans out. Who's actually going to buy it? Let's wait and see. I mean, I guess we were we, yeah. we had a bit of skepticism here because Neil Young has actually become the CEO of the company now. And so on the show a few weeks ago, we were talking about whether he is actually the best suited person to do it but then if he's the front person and there is somebody at the back that can actually do the business side of things then it could work out it's just a question of how the company is structured i'm betting that ceo thing is uh more the uh the moniker than the reality i think it's ironic that neil young who i had a chance to meet years ago at the bridge benefit who's who's been playing gigs for his whole life with screaming monitors the guy couldn't hear a siren if it was happening right behind his head so i'm not sure he'd be able to tell him warm anymore i'll tell you a funny story that he's backstage and brandon boyd has his in-ear monitors and neil young comes up and goes hey man uh so how are you using those in-ear monitors he goes it's great it really makes you know it's much better for your ears and neil young i'll never forget he goes maybe i can't use those i like to feel it from the stage and I'm thinking that's because you can't hear anymore <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why he developed it or you know maybe why, that's why he backed this in the first place uh, maybe he needs the hard of hearing version and I'll buy one yeah but you know you know I, I, hats off to him because you know I think 
it's a very smart idea because they've raised the money from the Kickstarter, but most of the money is going to yeah. have to go back to the, into the production and the delivery of the devices, so which is going to be expensive and logistically a nightmare. And so raising the extra money might actually help the company become more of a company rather than just a project that begins and ends. Yeah, with that, the, that's what it looks like. I think. So that's I mean, what it looks like. And of course, uh, you know, hats off to them. If, if he could raise this money, I, I would love to know who the investors are. I would love to know if it's fans, if it's actual investors that invest maybe half a million into this or uh, I don't uh, or I mates, you know. Oh, I'll tell you what, the five thousand isn't coming from some kid just starting. It's probably coming one of from one of his fans that listened to him as a lawyer or a doctor because five grand uh, is 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 not a small vote for most folks. Exactly, you know? exactly, and it's a lot. How of about five- you, Sammy? You won't see my name on that list. That's for sure. <laughs> And it's a lot of five grand votes if it's already five one six million. And uh, uh, Steve, actually, let's let's move on to you. Uh, uh, t- tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, the uh, Randman Music and Business Project. Or what, what's going on? Yeah, well, last I think when was I last on? I think it's about a year ago. And uh, um, our Renman MB thing started as this idea uh, for me to help artists and, and music professionals, you know, uh, learn about the real music business because so often I think people. Uh, who are interested in music have this kind of rather romantic notion of how it un- unfolds. You know, Sammy's smiling again. Yeah, that, that uh, just, yeah. <laughs> You know, and what happens is the music business is a different animal than making music. And when you bring in the business element, you know, things, you know, fundamentally change. And so when I look out there at the, at the landscape of the music space, whether it's Mixcloud, who offers some more great ways to listen to music, whether it's Bandpage, that are giving great tools to artists to help them make music, distribute music, and tell their own story. What I've found is, particularly true as I've gotten more and more direct contact with young artists and music professionals, is that what's lacking, in my opinion, is if you buy that all these are like your brand new shiny toys, it's like they didn't come with an instruction manual on how to use them, right? So making music is only part of the music business, understanding how that music turns into a career is quite another matter, right? And so um, over the last uh, couple of years, we started doing shows with my friends in the business. Yeah, I started with some of my grizzly old veteran friends. And as it's evolved, I've had an opportunity to speak to lots of young people like yourself, Sammy, and other people out there, Jay Sider, met lots of people that are trying to do something great in the music business it, 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 with a whole different backdrop than I grew up in the business with. So, um, so we've done these, you know, shows with our guests, you know, where we get record company presidents, publishers, artists, promoters, all the players in the business to come and share their stories of how, how they got started, how they managed to do something great in their careers. Not because there's any science to it. In fact, it's quite the opposite. There is no tried and true path for success, whether you're an artist, a label, and you know, manager, promoter, whatever. You'll find that there's as many different stories of how people did something great as there are people that have actually done it. So what we're doing now is taking this whole big picture idea of, of trying to mentor and trying to turn it into a bit more of a I hate to use the word academic, but a more structured approach to it. So we've started uh, a program we did at the top of this year, 12-week seminar or or online uh, class about the music business, my take on the music business. And we're in the process now of turning that into an interactive course that people, no matter where you are in the world, could find a place to learn about the music business without spending fifty or sixty thousand dollars at university, without going online and having some internet expert tell you about the music business because they read Don Passman's book, um, but have had no real experience in the music business, right? So um, that we're going to put out in October, and we're, it's going to be uh, our first product because in all this right. m- digital music space, the thing that I grapple with is that there's lots of cool things out there, uh, but in my experience, cool doesn't pay the bills. Yes, and cool doesn't right. allow you to do cool things that cost money unless you manage to, to put a business around that. So uh, we're attempting to take people's thirst for knowledge in, in about how to do something in the music business and, and see if we can offer a product that addresses that and, and, is, and is worthwhile, but do it at a, at a price that um, allows you to, to take a good look about whether you really want to do this music business uh, for a career. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, money doesn't fall, that doesn't grow on trees, unfortunately, in the digital business. And uh, any actually, business. <laughs> and actually, on that note, I would like to uh, thank, uh, I know they're, they're, they're on the intro of this show, but uh, I'd like to thank uh, Play MPE, uh, who are going to sponsor the next few weeks uh, worth of shows here at DMT. And uh, Play MPE provides a secure music distribution and promotional services to a, a slew of labels, uh, large and small. And they've been doing it for the past 10 years. And I've used them back when I was a Universal. And it was works uh, perfectly well and uh, it's, it's a fantastic service so check out plaympe.com I'd like to thank them for the support of the show and Sami uh, I wanted to ask you about what's going on uh, your side you said that you have a couple of interesting projects coming up but uh, uh, which is the one that you'd like to talk about most I don't know we've got a few things going on we've got some great records coming up uh, yeah. cooking vinyl um, got new Ali Campbell who's the uh, voice of UB40 formerly teamed up with a couple of the old UB40 guys and uh, we're putting out a great new album that's on playlist at the moment, Radio 2. Nice. Uh, Adam Cohen, new record from him, Lennon Cohen's son, brilliant record. We've got a few exciting things in the pipeline for next year as well, which I can't talk about right now. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, and independently, I'm doing a new Annie Lennox album, which we announced last week. Uh, and something else I can't talk about. Yeah. And on an independent <laughs> uh, level, I'm doing some great stuff at the moment with the research into technology use in the live industry Okay. Um, with some iBeacon technology, which I think is well overdue. And I'm trying to drag the live industry kicking and streaming, screaming, streaming, streaming, yes. <laughs> streaming the, would be better. Yeah, into the future, <laughs> yeah. That's one for the PowerPoint, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, loads, loads going on. We're having a, a great year over at Cooking Vinyl. That's fantastic. And so on the iBeacon front, uh, are you excited? I, I read something about Apple releasing their own iBeacon soon. Uh, is that something Well, that... so, they've been prepping for for a long time so, you know if about a year ago or so a lot of developers noticed they changed some terms and conditions they've they've been in the background prepping for this for a long time but um yeah. there's so many applications for it and some very cool case studies that have started coming out and it's um operates over bluetooth and can communicate with smartphones um and beacons that are placed around there's it, a lot of uh, people already using it in retail space yeah. um and i'm trying to figure out some of the best uses for it in music and I think there are loads of them um, and we're not looking at any at the moment so I've just teamed up with some partners independently to um, address that through my digital consultancy. Nice, nice, and uh, yeah, well, we'll see. If I, busy. We'll see if iBeacons <laughs> pops up in the in the announcement that is uh, uh, apparently is going to be on the 9th of September from Apple for the new iPhone. Uh, although uh, nobody knows they don't announce it usually until the week before. So. I've, I've given up following so, I, I just, um, I just, iPhone <laughs> announcement dates. What, what what a nonsense! Let's wait just, and see. I just Are feel we... bad for the journalists in the in the states that have to. I do. This is the new iPhone. Book, no, no, but they have, they have no, to book their flights. I know some people that have to book their flights because it just gets so expensive and they don't even know that the event is going to happen but they just book them anyway just because the rumor is so strong <laughs> yeah. maybe the hotels are starting the rumor yeah exactly it's crazy and uh, I wanted to end by talking about uh, Vivo so uh, Vivo um, there was an interesting piece on Billboard by Andrew Hamp and Ed Chrisman a collaboration between the two these two great writers at Billboard and the headline was very simple uh, who will buy Vivo now so the article summarizes the current situation of the company uh, reportedly Vivo is for sale and the process uh, is being led by Goldman Sachs uh, with the marketing material in circulation since the beginning of the month. Apparently there's a bunch of interested buyers but Billboard reports that the sale is far from being a done thing uh, since a financial advisor was quoted by the uh, publication as saying that the value of Vivo and its ability to make money are completely dependent on its licenses with the major yeah. labels Sony and Universal Music who are also part owners. So this kind of means that Aren't buyer... Always? <laughs> yes, uh, so <laughs> this could mean that the buyer could uh, buy a company that is worth uh, you know between 700 million and a billion dollars like it, it is quoted or it, that is worth nothing depending on the kind of licenses that come with it so I guess like the one thing that could prop up the valuation is if Universal and Sony agree to uh, X number of years term at the same rate so that people sort of can work out whether it can become a yeah, profitable I think business they'd have to. I think there'd have to be some some predetermined agreements in place like, so the, in other words it's an unknown quantity and I mean we don't have to get into it but I mean there's a million and one licensing issues this year especially stuff that's been affecting the independent sector yeah and I think I mean it's so volatile that I don't really think anyone would rush into that without knowing what they were going to get and you know the, the promise at the end of that 
and um, it, you know, it's up to the majors. They went in early as they normally do and got some decent stakes in a company. Yeah. Uh, and, so uh, Sammy, Sammy is your is cooking vinyl distributes via Vivo, YouTube, or yeah. Um, we we, I mean, we obviously we have a deal in place with Merlin, and there's yeah. various conversations going on at the moment. Of course, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Vivo. I mean, it's you know, is it's a platform for us that they were quite quick in cornering that and I mean remember even when I was back in independent a lot of the major artists that I worked for independently uh, the majority of our music videos at the time were pulled off YouTube and placed on Vivo and I had yeah. a lot of pissed off artists at the time um, that you know didn't understand it but for monetary value you know it, it makes sense and the, the promotion that can come along with those placements make sense so you know it has a for me it has a place in the market and we, we deal with vivo a lot we have a good relationship with them yeah um so yeah we'll just have to wait and see i think there was you know early on talk of various parties interested it's, it's interesting for me that google didn't go straight in I yeah. mean, obviously with the tie-in with youtube i think a lot of us presumed that would be a natural home so it's i don't know if it's telling or you know it's interesting that they didn't go straight in there but Dream, yeah. dreamworks as well had a a look at it so we'll have to wait and see but it's a see, it's yeah. a, a platform that's working for, for the majority of people i think yeah absolutely uh, so steve what are your thoughts on vivo and uh, uh, also quickly if you, if you want to run us through your thoughts on the current situation between youtube and independence because i haven't had the chance to ask you yet about that i don't know enough about that to to, to make an intelligent conversation except to say that um at the, at the kind of uber big picture level um the music business has a long history of creating their own monsters uh, that are there to help the music companies break artists and then ultimately it takes a turn in there and I think because YouTube has such might out there um, they could certainly qualify for a new gatekeeper um, and, and, and they set their own rules with a uh, with a fervor <laughs> that, that some might read is arrogance, you know. Uh, I thought it was interesting, and that's why I think it's always good to have some different outlets for stuff, whether it's, you know, Vivo to play videos and YouTube or other outlets where you can have a balance uh, on, the, on the playing field. Yeah. Uh, I, I was looking at the list of um, potential buyers here, DreamWorks and Verizon and Amazon and Yahoo, right? And it's funny, you know, somebody was talking about, you know, you know, Apple buying beats, you know, uh, for the curation. You know, my read as a grizzly old veteran of the music business is that Apple misread where the music market was going. Their business was built on downloads fueling their iPods or, and their iPads and all of that stuff. And that was their interest in it, you know, yeah. is the market has now moved towards streaming, right? They launched a product and their product wasn't very good. And, and, you know, but they have, what, $60 billion sitting around in the bank. So they did what yeah. record companies did for years, which is went out and bought cool, right? Um, and um, yeah, they did. so I, huh? Yeah, they, I, mean, they did. I mean, that's Beats, is yeah. especially, you know, founded on going out and making those artist relationships and the endorsements. You know, there's some genius behind a lot of that marketing. But but it, the, but it didn't lead to an overwhelmingly successful s service at the time it was bought. Perhaps it would play out over time. And I think this idea of curation, the, 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 the web business, the tech business has this unbelievable capacity to invent and, 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 and you know, dramatize these new terms like curating. No, curating no, but the cu curation, Pierre, I mean, I, I honestly believe that there's a, a game changers coming in that area when we are you know moving to streaming and of course there are still plenty of other revenue streams but I'm a firm believer in streaming is only going to get stronger but there, there's products even with Spotify have products in the wings which they're <laughs> testing in some countries now um, for retail space and commercial licenses for things and curation it's only going to get more important I'd, I'd put yeah. my money on that well I, I think the idea of having you know it, I was talking about more the term than the idea the idea of having you know people give you suggestions about things you might like it's been going on since time immemorial they just didn't call yeah. it curation and this whole idea of a computer you know making these choices for you it seems a bit impure. It seems a little bit hard. And, and, and they were right? crap when they started. They were terrible. I mean, I remember some of the music recommendation systems. But I mean, some of them are getting very smart. And like Spotify bought FNS some time ago, and the 
the system for the more data that we generate the more more and especially through streaming um they're able to collect that data and see what we're listening to whereas we wouldn't have been able to there was no tracking when we bought cds and you know you were listening to this you were also buying this the, the more data that becomes available i think the more relevant the the, the recommendations yeah, and the uh, easier it is to serve it up to people right so that it happens invisibly all of a sudden songs that you're interested keep coming up and then perhaps some new stuff that you heard so that i think that's all great stuff but i think it's been going on for a long time but the, this article hit the nail on the head the licensing has always been an issue and the music business does not have a great track record of playing well with others right right no um, we, do, and, we don't and, at all and, and I think that there's a part of me that every time I read one of these things that think I, I haven't seen too many businesses get sold because they were making too much money or were too easy to run, right? So you mentioned right there out of the box, the, the fact that Google, who's got a gazillion dollars in the bank, is sitting this one out. Call me cynical. It makes me think they might know more than everybody else. And so if this thing gets bought by Marissa Meyer because she feels like she needs to do something to pop, pop up the stock or Jeffrey Bezos needs to do something to prop up his kind of second rate phone or the guys at Verizon think, Jesus, if we could just get all these videos in here and slip a two ninety nine charge and everybody will forget it, that could be a good thing. Somebody's going to buy what they don't have. I think your comments, Sammy, is sticking in my head. The guys that are closest to it are sitting it out. That seems it just it just kind of interesting. I mean, unless I don't don't know how it affects you know the, the advertising web and stuff, but it's interesting. I guess like the, the the most interesting thing about it is the fact that YouTube is about to to start a music streaming service. <laughs> let's, be, let's not get into that. Then it's going to be closely no, tied to a video service as well. And so, what role is Vivo going to play as part of that? if any part of those tracks are cacheable. Just before we, we started filming, I noticed that there was a couple of um, stories out on a, on a potential leak of the, the new YouTube, Google yeah. uh, streaming service. And I mean, I, obviously we were in conversations with them some months ago about things and we're still at this point in time haven't managed to reach a, a deal through, through Merlin for the licenses. But um, it's obviously coming quickly and it's... It, it, if they haven't jump, jumped in to buy Vivo, it's but yeah. How does that form part of it going forward? And it's again, it's just it's interesting to see that they didn't go straight in there, and and to who will pick that up, and how how will that continue for music videos? Because they'd have to migrate. If if it was bought by a separate company, presumably we'd have to migrate all music videos back from Vivo over there. There's a lot of back catalogue that was shifted all over to Vivo. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, we're sort of as intrigued as anyone else as to how this one's going to play out. I think. Yes, exactly. And, uh, it's, it's an exciting space, though, and uh, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things happening, especially as Warner, for example, is not part of Vivo and they have their own MCN, and so they have, like, uh, they're open to do whatever they like, essentially, at this point. Uh, and uh, so, as usual, uh, as usual, it's a confusing time, but it's a very exciting time, and I would like and to And is it thank... not a confusing time? Yes, exactly. <laughs> the music uh, business, are you kidding me? If you want law and order, it's go, also there. go it's, it's, into I the post so office. The most exciting time to some degree as well. There's so much going on. I mean, if you look, you know, this year, especially in, in the last couple of years, it's an exciting time as well as being incredibly confusing. Yeah. And um, it, gonna, it, it really is. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to head out to Germany actually tomorrow and, and f figure out what's going on uh, there at uh, CO Pop uh, in Cologne. And then I'm going to be at Berlin Music Week in a couple of, uh, in a couple of weeks. And so uh, I'll probably shine a bit of a spotlight on what's happening in the German music market uh, right now. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank my guests uh, for this week. Uh, so uh, Steve Rennie, uh, you can find everything from Steve on uh, RenmanMB RenmanMB.com or uh, YouTube.com slash RenmanMB. Uh, uh, you should subscribe to the channel. It's it's fantastic, and I uh, watch it uh, religiously. And uh, uh, thanks so much, Steve, for, for joining me today. All right, thank you. And I, I think I'd like to have Sammy on one day. I love uh, <laughs> your perspective and uh, your sunny disposition. It's all good. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, your English accent is a big bonus, too, over here. <laughs> My northern, northern twang. See, the Americans, kill, they don't know Northern. So they, they go, yeah, this, we like her. We like Sammy. As opposed to my uh, highly malleable accent, which is uh, uh, Italian and varies between British and American, depending on who I'm talking to. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Sammy, thanks so much uh, as well. Uh, Sammy from Cooking Vinyl. You can find everything on cookingvinyl.com. If you don't know much about the label, you should. They have some fantastic releases coming out. And so uh, also check out their uh, YouTube channel, which I would imagine is uh, youtube.com slash cookingvinyl. I'm making it up, but I hope it's right. I think so. I haven't <laughs> got it in front of you. Awesome. Find it on the website. 
Great. Uh, I'll pop the, the, the links in the show notes as well. Uh, and thanks so much for listening to the show today. Uh, DMT comes out every week. You can also check out the DMT One to One show, uh, which uh, uh, has got some interesting guests this week. Uh, we'll talk about uh, two startups and uh, the different digital music companies. Uh, uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week. And until uh, next time.